Right, welcome everybody to the Handheld Book Club. My name is Kate McDonald and I run Handheld Press. And there's no point in me saying to my left and right because the vision is going to be difficult, different for all of you. So Gail, Gail Lasda, can you wave your hand, please? This is Gail Lasda from the London Review Bookshop in London in Bloomsbury. And she and I are going to be having a conversation about this book which is absolutely wonderful. It's one that we published, Business as Usual. Now, Holly, or Kat, Kat Marsh, can you wave your hand? Kat Marsh is my elder daughter. She runs our, <laughs> that's perfectly fine, Amanda. She runs our Instagram and our YouTube, and she's co-hosting and that she will let people in and out. If you want to ask questions, can you put them in the chat? And then Kat will tell me about the questions when we come to question time so we can get them answered. But Kat will be in charge of, filtering and making sure we have questions and, and so on and so forth. Right, could I ask everyone at the moment to put your mics on mute? If you want to have your video off as well, that's absolutely fine. But if your mics are on mute, then you won't, you can have people invade your room and it will be absolutely fine. So Gail, tell me about your first experience of reading business as usual when it landed on your desk. What was it like? Just totally delightful. <laughs> Uh, um, I, I I read about, but I read, I guess, in your catalogue or something like that, um, that you were publishing it. And as soon as I read the synopsis, I knew it was very much up my street. Um, and yeah, it's just one of those books that's just a totally joyful experience to read. Um, I, I've read it twice now, and both times I burst into tears at the end oh. of reading it. Oh, goodness, really? um, yeah, so I'm a huge fan. Oh, <laughs> that's just amazing. Okay, I'm, I'm very gratified. It is <laughs> turning out to be the kind of book that someone will read and immediately buy a copy for their mother or their sister Definitely. or their aunt. It's, it's a book that women want to pass to women. Yeah, I know men are enjoying it, but honestly, I don't get the stories from the men. The women are the ones that tell me or it's evident in their orders that come through to us that they want to give it to other women, which is just so lovely. Yeah, um, I've already given it to at least two of my friends. Oh, that's good. <laughs> We've had to reprint it recently in a hurry because we advertised it in the Booksellers Association Christmas catalogue. And foolishly, I hadn't quite realised the enthusiasm this advert <laughs> So we we are we were down to 39 copies in Britain at one point. But wow. this is being rapidly redressed. And our printer is very pleased with this. Mm -hmm. um, I think I should tell the story of how I discovered the book, because it is one of my pet projects. I had never heard of it. I've never heard of the authors until, let me think, this must have been, we published it in March. So I think it... It was in the late summer 2019, I was giving a talk at the Angela Thurkell Society in London at the AGM. And I did my talk and then we had cake and sandwiches. And then some of the members had brought down a few books they wanted to sell to other members, just like a private book sale. And I was rootling through the books and I discovered this pink covered volume with no title on it whatsoever. It was clearly somebody had put their own handmade paper wrapper. So you had to open the book to find out. And I opened the book at a telegram page. And if you've read Business as Usual, you will realize, or you remember, that there are not only illustrations, but there are pages which are telegrams, pages which are lists, pages which are internal memoranda. And I was hooked. So I bought the book for three pounds and I read it on the train home to Bath and I nearly missed my stop. It was that good. And by the time we got to Didcot, I had realized that we must republish this and where could I find the rights? So I was busy using my phone on 4G trying to find who are the authors? Where can I find the estates? Who, how do I trace these people? Um, and it was very difficult. I made my first breakthrough by just Googling. I Googled Jane Oliver, the author. And immediately her name came up in connection with the Fording Bridge Local History Society in Hampshire, which sometime in the 1970s or early 80s had published an article about Jane Oliver, who had lived near Fording Bridge. So I wrote to the secretary, who's secretary of the, the society now, and said, here I am, I've read this book, I would like to find out how to trace the estate of Jane Oliver and Anne Stafford. And he rang me back just as I was getting off the train at Oxford about a week later on my way to, to give a, a lecture at Oxford Brooks 
And so I could barely hear him over the train noises. And I had to bellow, I'm in Oxford giving a lecture. Can I ring you back? Hoping to impress him with my credentials because he was a lawyer. This was the point. He was extremely cautious, didn't want to give any connections away. Anyway, he put me in touch with Jane Oliver's nephew, who lives in Orkney. And as it happened, um, my husband and I were going to go to Orkney the next summer. And I think time had ticked on a bit by then, but we're now several months away. So we went to Orkney for our holiday anyway, and we met up with David Murdoch, who is the nephew of Jane Oliver, and he showed us lots and lots of family paper. He showed us his complete collection of all Jane Oliver's books. And most importantly, he gave me biographical information. So I was able with that to write the introduction. And once I had the biographical information, I was able to start doing the bibliographical research and scour the British Library catalogue and other catalogues looking for their books, which is why I came up with the number of 97 books that these two women wrote between them in their careers, which is phenomenal. I don't think I know of any other author or pair of authors who've published that many books, unless we're thinking about children's series of very small picture books or something like that. I don't know. So that was how I found the book. Um, and I was it was a passion project. When we publish books, I have to feel really, really enthusiastic. Otherwise, what is the point? If I can't sell a book because I love it, then who is going to do that for me? No one. So this one was one I knew about by halfway through the book on the first reading, which doesn't often happen. So that was how it came to me. But it's the, the loss of these women. Their names are no longer known. Their books are no longer read. They're simply gone, absolutely forgotten. And it's really not very clear why. It is incredible, but for, for, for it to be that number of books, like 97, I think you said, um, is just, I mean, it, it's a real, really sort of, the fact that it's the kind of books they wrote, sort of romance stories that people don't think is worth, you know, worth preserving and, and worth republishing. Absolutely. And it's just, yeah, yeah it's really sad. It's really strange. I mean, clearly it's a public taste thing. Mm. Is anyone here listening? Have you actually read anything else by Jane Oliver or Anne Stafford? I'm going to take that as a no because no one <laughs> tweeted it. No, good, fine. We are, oh, here we are. Never heard of, well, quite. Well, I did start reading a few others and I think this is, this book is an example of the difficult second album problem. The first album is absolutely amazing, but the second, <laughs> Holly, you're laughing at me. The second <laughs> album is just rubbish and it's very difficult for the band to get back to that initial passionate momentum. And I think this is what this book represents. It was not Jane Oliver's first book, it was her second, um, but it really worked for both of them. There is mm -hmm. a sequel to Business as Usual and it's really not very good. Oh, I was gonna ask you about that, that's such a shame. I know. Um, it's a difficult thing. I don't really want to give spoilers, but the authors resurrect Basil. Oh no, well, he quite. doesn't need resurrecting. He doesn't need resurrecting. Um, and he's active in the second novel. And also Michael is absent in the second novel because he's sent away on a business trip. And the novel is mainly about domestic chaos, about the search, it's, it's called Cook, something like Cook General but it's in the search for domestic servants, someone who will stay and look after the baby and so on. Mm. And it's just nothing like as good. I think it shows that business as usual is brilliant because it's about working in a shop. And this is why I wanted you, Gail, to be in this panel, so to speak, because this novel is a really unusual, well, it's a rare example of retail history in fiction, which is also comedy. Have you come across anything like this before? I mean, books about booksellers, there are, a select few yeah I think definitely you're right in terms of the the sort of detail of, of retail is I think is quite unusual um like you say there are other I was trying to think of sort of other bookseller slash libra librarian novels that I've read and there are a few but I think they're always more sort of character studies rather than like people like Anita Bruckner is the, the one that I really thought of um mm -hmm. which is obviously a very different thing and, and sort of definitely Definitely not comic for a start, <laughs> um, but also, um, yeah, it doesn't have that, like the setting is is another character in business of you, as usual, I think, like, mm. 
it's sort of as much it's it's more about that than it is about sort of the romance or anything else yeah i mean the, the fact that business as usual is set in a department store gives you almost infinite scope mm. for what you want to talk about and what complications and plot divigations you can introduce definitely it's like its own sort of little contained ecosystem and you yeah. can you can bring anything in from that and it's a world a world mm. with its own standards its own conventions its own hierarchy of class and status and position yeah. and duration of service as well yeah um it is yeah it is an extraordinary depiction of what it might have been like to work in a department mm. store yeah and the retail, the, the his, yeah, the history of, re and also the history of libraries. I went on quite a bit in my introduction writing about the history of libraries because subscribing libraries and circulating libraries were completely different in the 1920s and 30s compared to what we know now. And that's a cultural shift that it's, it needs to be explained to really understand how this bookshop worked because it's a library and a bookshop and the two terms yeah. are interchangeable. But then you've got people like keep the Asp Distra flying. That's also a circulating library. So it's a fact of 1930s life as well. Yeah, it is it, like I, I, the first time I heard about sort of this as a, this idea of a library it is it is strange to someone who's only ever known libraries as sort of a, you know, a state owned yeah. sort of public service rather than something that people actually paid for and subscribed yeah. to. And it, it, all, it all depended on how much you paid, which mm. is why I think that section where Hillary is reorganizing the way people can claim their books is such a, I wouldn't say it's socialistic, but it's certainly egalitarian. Yeah. The way she stops people feeling shamed because they have the smallest possible subscription. Yeah. Um, yeah. What other aspects, apart from bursting into tears twice, <laughs> other, what other emotional responses did the book give you? Or what intellect? <laughs> Um, I think sort of linked to what you were just saying about the her egalitarian reorganizing of the of the floor. I think I was really surprised by sort of how much um, there was about class in it. I think you talk about this a little bit in your introduction. Um, but I think that level of sort of awareness of, of her privilege um, in in the position, her pr privileged position in the sort of ecosystem of the of the shop, like comparing herself to um, I can't remember her name, but some of the longer serving women who've been there who are a bit sort of stuck and sort of trapped there, basically, even if yeah. they sort of enjoy it and sort of and have loyalty to the company, they're still sort of trapped there by the fact that they have no nowhere else to go and sort of no um, Mr. Grant to come and rescue them. Um, no, yeah. And, there's and I think that aspect is really interesting. And I, I, I don't, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I feel like it's probably quite unusual to have that level of sort of discussion of class in a book that is essentially a sort of workplace romance novel yeah and it's also it's it's a set it's a, it's a temporal setting too because it's the the tail end of the depression mm. and work was in short supply work was hard to get work for single women was really hard to get yeah as we see from hillary's um trajectory but then she sees the evidence of what she might be like possibly if the classes were different in 20 years time with the women who are still there and nothing is changing and that's yeah. and they too will become fossilized um yes it's it's an interesting novel to think about from a, a career or a feminist or a career perspective because hillary is perfectly clearly only doing the job until she gets married yeah and she will leave the job when she gets married because that's what women of her class did but the women that don't get married keep on working but they're career women and they're absolute professionals. Some of those women are better at their jobs than Hillary could ever possibly be because they are skilled in that particular way, which is a form of respect you wouldn't normally expect in a conventional light, light romantic comedy. Mm. Yeah, I think we need some questions. People, have you got any questions? Liz, I can rely on you for a question, surely. Where have you got to? There you are. I can see I'm you. here. I'm here. Um, of the other novels written by the same authors, do they have the same feminist credentials as this one? And I suppose you could ask the question, do you think this novel has is intentionally feminist? Um, I think it's I think it's feminist because it's 
valorizing the fact that women can and should work and have professional lives. The marriage aspect is because people like a little bit of romance and it sells, it really sells fiction, but they needn't have been as feminist as they were. So I think, I think they did deliberately set out to write a book saying it's great to be a single woman and working in a career on a career path. I think that was um, deliberate. As to other books that they have written, um, I've tried three or four of Helen of Jane Oliver's own, which were basically people. It, there were romances. Um, there was no professional or career element at all in those particular plots. And as I've already said, the sequel to Business as Usual is not about career at all. It's about domesticity and adapting to becoming married and having babies and whatnot. Anne Stafford, who is the illustrator and clearly had some input, well, quite a lot of input into Business as Usual. In the Second World War, she wrote a novel called, um, oh, I forget, Army of Banners, something like that. It's a memoir of different kinds of voluntary work that women could do in the Second World War. And the first half is absolutely riveting. It's one of the best wartime memoirs I've ever read because it's all about um, what it was like driving an ambulance in the Blitz. It's superb. But the second half suddenly turns into government propaganda for let's join the WVS, let's join the Wrens, let's join the WAF. And this the, the protagonist trails around different units of different women's voluntary service units to show the reader what it could be like. So I decided I didn't want to republish that because it has that major flaw in the second half. It just, the tone is all wrong. But that too is valorizing the strength and the effort of women and what they can do. But there's very little pay because it's wartime conditions and I don't think they were paid very much anyway. And they were only allowed to do these jobs because the men were away fighting. So I don't know if that counts as feminist. But that's the extent of my tasting of their work, really. I don't particularly feel inclined to keep trying because I haven't yet found anything like as good as business as usual, which is why I said it was like the tricky first album. Does that answer you, Liz? Yep, it does. Yep. I mean, I suppose, can I, can I ask a follow-on question? Yeah, you may. Okay, so if you like business as usual, and obviously you don't want to read the sequel because who has time for Basil? Um, what should we be reading next? <laughs> well, I think you have to go to Miss Pettigrew Liz for a Day by Winifred, oh, <laughs> by Winifred Watson, which is published by Persephone. And that was a massive hit and, and it was made into a film because it's a very I, similar kind of novel, but with a lot more wish fulfillment and a lot more romance and very little about a working environment. But that's the obvious one. Kat, you were nodding wildly then. It's got a very good film adaptation. No, you're too quiet. I can't hear you. Is it louder? It has a very good film adaptation. Yes, I remember you watching it. Yeah, the film adaptation is very uh, funny. You also have a, an observation in the chat. No, I missed that. Put your, put your mic the up. The chat. The chat. Okay. Oh, right. Is there a question in chat? Yes. Oh, oh I've got chat here. Um, do, 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 do. <laughs> Andrea, right, there's a question from Amanda Q. Okay, or Amanda, da, 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 da. So Kate Slotover says, not so much a question, but an observation. I found it haunting that it's pre-war. Ah, interesting. Yes. The thought that, well, obviously nobody knew in 10, well, six years time, London would be at war and seven years time would be, in bomb, would be being bombed to bits. It's very interesting that, yeah, considering this is a London novel, heaven knows there are thousands of London novels. And this one is indubitably about London because London is the heart. She goes to London, she leaves London, she comes back to London. Everything happens in London. And it's about bed sitting rooms and boarding houses and apartments and fancy mansions and grand dinners and going to the theatre. So it's a celebration of London, what it's like living in London as a single woman, how you can do it. It's not really a primer. And this is something that, um, Lucy Scholes, who is a literary critic and has done the introduction of one of our books coming out next year, she and other, other women of her age, and Gail, this might resonate with you, she said this is such a millennials book because it's a book about women coming to London to find a job and 
get going. Would you agree? I do. I do agree. I, I see where she's coming from. I think like all of the stuff about sort of horrible, damp, rented accommodation and all of that stuff is, yeah, it's all happening still. <laughs> um, and yeah, I do. Um, sort of going back to the feminist point as well, I think a lot of the stuff that sort of comes up that I'm, I really wasn't expecting from, um, I guess, a novel of this era and so I guess I approached it sort of thinking it was going to be maybe a little twee than it actually is. Um, and so there's a, a lot of the sort of social realism stuff I, I was really surprised by, especially I think the, the bit that really stood out for me was, um, I can't remember her name, but the girl in on the dress floor when she gets pregnant and how that is dealt with is really incredible, I think, like, yeah. for the time really outspoken for the time admitting yeah. you're integrating a, an illegitimate pregnancy in a light romantic comedy yeah and then dealing with it in a humane way with dignity and showing that these are the most most important factors necessary when dealing with this situation mm. yeah that was extraordinary and so refreshing yeah that, definitely. it was just lovely it was a bit of a spoiler, I have to say, but I hope we're not spoiling it too much. And, and where Basil really shows his colours. He certainly does, <laughs> yeah. Yes, maybe we should talk about characterisation, um, because we have... You have two more questions in the chat as well. Oh, are there? Oh, whiz, whiz, whiz. I've got Liz saying she wants a title. Liz, I will... I don't know what to do. The, the book is in a different room, and I'm not <laughs> going to break off now and run to the book, and I honestly can't remember the title of the book, but... Uh, I will have to make it known in a different way. I'll work on that one. Or I'll email. Okay. It. Thanks. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> um, is that all for the chat so far? No, yes. There's one more above. Whoop, more above. Ah, yes, yes, Amanda. Can you tell me more about paid libraries? Oh, you're in America. Okay, right. Americans seem to be blah, 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 blah. okay, right. Okay, sympathies on book selling being tough. Um yeah. So paid libraries in the, gosh. So Jane Austen, she went to subscribing and circulate. She went to subscribing libraries, subscription libraries in Bath and possibly in London. I don't actually know if she ever visited London, but when she lived in Bath and hated it, she went to the subscription library. So subscription libraries, you paid a sum of money as a monthly fee which gave you the right to browse the shelves and borrow a book for an even smaller fee. And you changed the books. That was a subscription library. So that was in the uh, very beginning of the 19th century. A hundred years later, circulating libraries had begun as well, where you would again pay a fee to borrow a book. And you would have at the very grottiest end of the spectrum, you would have a tobacconist shop, a shop that would sell pipes and tobacco and cigarettes might have a back room where really, really tatty books were kept, probably quite a lot of pornography as well. And this would be available to regular customers for a fee. So that would be a, a circulating library. Further up the social scale, you would get Moody's, um, you would get Boots, and you would get WH Smith. This is all end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, which for were for the middle classes and upwards, and they would again pay a fee and have access to a very wide range of books that they could borrow. And these books would be posted to them. They could go per, in person to collect them and change the books, or they would have the books arriving in the post. And this kind of library was the norm until the idea of the state library. And in Britain, um, Carnegie, the Carnegie libraries are the big state libraries in, in that there was a, a, Scots, a Scottish guy called something or other Carnegie. My father would be absolutely furious. I can't remember his first name. But anyway, Mr. Carnegie was a Scot who went to America, made a vast fortune and spent it on building libraries in Britain. So many of the big, immense um, buildings from the 19th century, which now are poor, very poorly funded public libraries were from Carnegie Foundation donations and they were public so anyone could join for no money at all and borrow a library so that's the difference and the Carnegie libraries and the subscription circulating libraries were all kind of separate but as the 20th century wore on the, the money side disappeared and it became possible to buy sorry to borrow books for no money now I'm just going to check in case anyone is correcting me because I agree <sighs> No, I, Andrew, thank you, Liz, thank you. Andrew Carnegie, you're welcome, Amanda. Whew, right, 
So I hope that's answered your questions about libraries. Now, I have another There's question for Ros. Sorry, Hal? Uh, Ros says, how unusual was the unwanted pregnancy storyline for the time? And what kind of reception would storylines like this have? Um, yeah. in, my, in, in my experience, exceptionally unusual because publishers could be prosecuted for publishing material which was deemed to be obscene or immoral. Um, there are very famous cases, mostly to do with sexual behavior, but actually publishing a book where you have the results of sexual behavior between the unmarried was pretty rare um, because it would have been deemed immoral. And treating a woman who had got pregnant with sympathy and allowing her to have a happy life after that pregnancy would have been shockingly immoral from the from the the, the dominant moral factor of the time, which would have been the Church of England. As it happens, we will be publishing in 2022 another novel published in 1921, um, so a good 10 years earlier than business as usual, which is all about an illegitimate, an illegitimate pregnancy um, between an unmarried woman and a married man. Uh, it's called Latchkey Ladies by Marjorie Grant Cook. And um, yes, that's coming out in a year and a half's time. So that's the only other book I've actually discovered which had an unwanted pregnancy storyline. So clearly they're there, but they're rare. And I think that's the best answer I can offer you. I hope that will do. So far, yeah. What do you think, Gail? Have you come across any unwanted? Um, I'm trying to think of specific examples. I, I feel like it's the sort of thing that, it did come up but not in this kind of book I think sort of more you know literary for want of a better word um, yeah maybe possibly, sort of that kind of thing, but... possibly um I, I I've just thought of two more examples which were they the, the the problem was put back in the past so John Buchan the great writer John Buchan on whom I have done vast amounts of research and writing his wife Susan Tweetmuir she wrote a novel called Cousin Harriet, which is set in the mid 19th century in which a young girl becomes pregnant and her cousin Harriet helps her deal with the pregnancy, find a home for the baby and so on. But that was sanitized because it was put in the past. And I see that Barbara has made a comment, Wilkie Collins maybe. I haven't read enough Wilkie Collins to be able to pick out an unwanted pregnancy plot, but I think you're probably right because it's a, I think he was a writer that could get away with it. And also, uh, Naomi Royd Smith. She, I've just read a novel in which she deals with an illegitimate pregnancy in the early 19th century in a historic novel, historical novel, and it's called A Delicate Situation. So there must be fiction out there that deals with it, more, more fiction, but I suspect that the historical novel route is the safer way they could do it. I would say also probably, I mean, obviously we don't know what happens to the character in this novel, um, but it's sort of I think you can assume that she kind of has a relatively happy outcome from from what happens to her, which I feel like is probably something you don't get. Like if, if someone does have an unwanted pregnancy, they get punished for their sins. You know? Exactly. Yeah, there has to be a, mo a moral yeah. treatment of it to make it acceptable as a, as a book you can sell to the public who mustn't be led astray. I think that that is how the morality factor would work at the period. Oh, thank you, Margaret. Oh, did she come back? Oh, that's good. I'd forgotten that. Oh, is she? I've done that too. Oh, right. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. Um, it just occurred to me, Dorothy L. Sayers, terrific novelist, also had an illegitimate son out of wedlock yeah. at this period in the beginning of the 30s. So clearly it was happening. This is working from life. I doubt very much there's a connection between, I mean, because nobody knew about this baby mm. apart from Sayers herself and one or two very close friends who helped look after it. So it would have been a dead secret, but you know, she was a career woman who did this. Yeah. Any other questions before we lurch into the idea of form? I don't want to get too literary technical about this, but <laughs> it's, it struck me that the different for the different forms and formats of the letters really, really contribute to how the story is told because you have lists, you have letters, you have memoranda with colleagues, you've got the fabulous telegram. What other forms of... I think the best one is um, 
and this is a spoiler, I, I'm assuming everyone's read it, but um, <laughs> the uh, sort of postal receipt when she returns her engagement ring mm, is yeah. like the most perfect little tiny bit of storytelling. It's incredible. It is. It does everything. And it's a tiny box on one page and it does the work of four pages of writing. <clears throat> we worked so hard to recreate that because in the in the book, the the, te- the the postal receipt is is drawn as a piece of line art, but using type typesetting. So the typesetters had physically done the rules and they put the letters in, in in the forms, but it's the wrong typeface for what we what we use in our books. So we had to recreate it using well, our, our designer had to recreate it from scratch, like I, like the original designer did. <clears throat> but that, that took a lot of juggling to get the right dimensions to make it look as exactly the same as we could as the original. But it had to be, it had to be absolutely recreated. And it, it's a it's a gasp out loud moment when you go, what's this about? Oh, this is what it's about. And yeah, it just does the work of the writing. It's so effective and not overused. There's only one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's it. So the different... Um... I think another great thing um, about the sort of sorry uh switching between the the different um forms um is the sort of progression of her and michael's relationship because they start off with these sort of formal internal memoranda and then there's sort of a little kind of flirty postscript on one of the memoranda and then she sort of finds an excuse to write him a proper letter at home and it's just i I just love the way that that is kind of the the form sort of mirrors their their sort of changing relationship yeah and then she tells someone about when she went to Michael's flat when he had damaged his foot and sat with him in his library and he has a library I mean what could be a better as a signal of a a, a desirable party than a man who has his own library and library steps that she can sit on it's it's um very idealized it's wonderful and the drawings we haven't really mentioned the drawings properly did you like the drawings people do hope so because Anne Stafford's line art is just so clever um every single what the only pictures we didn't recreate were from the end papers in the first edition because i was working from a reprint from the 1960s <laughs> we certainly do get a sense of a personality the um the end papers of the first edition which i've seen in the british library the first one at the beginning of the book has a picture of hillary running with her hat coming off and her bag coming to pieces knowing she's late, running to join the queue of employees waiting to clock in at every man's. And at the end of the book, the end papers are Hillary and Michael walking off away from work at the end of the day, arm in arm. They've done their jobs, they're going home now. So you get a sense of the trajectory, but it's also a bit of a spoiler. If you happen to glance at the end papers mm-hmm. at the back, you think, oh, so this is what happens. But I hadn't seen them until the book, we got our book to the printers. I didn't have a chance to get the British Library before then. But uh, yeah, Anne Stafford's, the economy of line and the humour, she's not afraid to be grotesque. She can be charming. She can be really idealistic. Yes, it's a lovely, lovely range of little sketches, which, yeah, they give personality. They really, really show the personality of the two writers. Are there any other questions at all, at all, at all? Because I'm looking at my notes now. What else did we want to talk about? Oh, I don't know. Let's have a look. Nope, I think everybody has had all their questions. Gail, have you tried, when you said you gave the book to other people, what responses did you get? Everyone I know who I've given it to has loved it (laughs) that's good (laughs) I think it's just I think especially sort of this year um working in the shop we're definitely getting more requests than usual for sort of like nice charming pleasant things to read because you know everyone's had enough horror do do people (laughs) really say can you give me a nice book yes absolutely and I usually find it really difficult because I read bleak horrible books most of the time um so having this to recommend to people has been wonderful and it's yeah every, it, I don't even have to put any effort in selling selling it because as soon as you put the sort of premise out there people love it oh good good do we Amanda asked do we have any other books about booksellers that we would recommend mm. 
Well, this is your department. What do you well, think? <laughs> I, um, I was talking about Anita Bruckner um, earlier, and I do love her, although I don't think, I mean, she's a, obviously a completely different um, vibe to mm. business as usual. Um, I listened to the audiobook of um, Undue Influence by Anita Bruckner recently. Um, I don't uh -huh. know if you've read that. Um, and it is such a sort of, the main character is, is a bookseller in a secondhand um, bookshop in Bloomsbury. And she is one of the sort of nastiest, vainest, kind of pettiest characters I've ever read. Um, so yeah, completely different, but also wonderful. Um, and obviously look at me as well. Um, mm -hmm. And she's like, is she a librarian? Look at me rather than- a... I've never read that one. I've only I think she's a librarian. One. Okay. Um, but yeah, they, I, I can think of more librarians than I can booksellers, mm. I think. Um, I, there's one by, it's called The Bookshop, and it's by the woman who won the booker for Offshore. Penelope Fitzgerald. Yeah, Penelope Fitzgerald, The Bookshop. That is brilliant. Yeah. It's a very, very good novel about a bookshop and the woman who sets it up and runs it. Um, so I, I would recommend that. And it's easily available because it's not very old. Um, Keep the Aspidistra Flying by George Orwell, which I have read the beginning few chapters of until I couldn't stand it any longer. It begins with a 1930s circulating library that the owner, well, the man who works in the shop, absolutely despises. Um, so it's very, very jaundiced and sour, but it's good for background history if you're interested in that. Oh, we got along with Miss Pettigrew. Ah, oh, Miss Bunkle's book. I've not read that. I gave that to my mother, but she hasn't let me read it. And you, oh, a film of the bookshop. Oh, oh, tell what the Geraldine, sorry, the Penelope Fitzgerald one. Didn't know that. Yes, I do remember it coming out. I haven't seen it though. Oh, interesting. I have no idea. What a television film or a cinema film? I think I'm pretty That's sure it's on one. Netflix, yeah. Mum. Sorry? I'm pretty sure it's on Netflix. Okay. Cinema, right. I will look that up. I might. No, I probably won't. I don't watch TV or cinema or film. I just don't, I can't. <sighs> yes, um, responses to the book. Ah, Bookshop, My Salinger Year, yes. Mm. Now, who was in that? It was some, it was, a, was it a film about someone reading nothing but Salinger all year? Um, no, it's, it's a, um, it's a, a book and then they've just turned it into a film about a woman who works in the literary agency for Salinger and she's supposed to send back these form letters to his fans and <laughs> instead she starts writing her own um, and it's set in New York I think in the oof, mid 90s but very archaic literary agency that refuses to there's one computer and you basically have to get permission to use it so everything's typewritten and, okay. and you've got a lot of descriptions of like listening to things on dictaphone um Gosh. yeah I, I enjoyed it I wouldn't I wouldn't say it was as good as business as usual but I'd say mm. it's like it was a memorably good book um mm. and I think they've got Sigourney Weaver in the film and typewriters so on the basis of those two things I might watch it I'll, pro I'll probably watch it to be fair <laughs> my word typewriters remember them mm. yeah I got a typewriter for my 18th birthday it was, it was really useful. Was. Very useful. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just I've just remembered. I do have a, a celebrity anecdote. Um, we had an advert in the LRB for business as usual. Um, it was the first ad we could afford. I think we must have got a really, really cheap rate in the LRBs. So we got a tiny little advert for business as usual, and suddenly sales shot up. And I got an email from Susan Hill. You know, like the woman in black, Susan Hill, the immensely famous author, Susan Hill, saying, oh, I love the advert. It really made me laugh because it was a bloody depressing LRB issue. Please, can I order a copy? <laughs> so she ordered a copy of Business as Usual. And the week after, she ordered two more, one of which I had to send to one of her friends or relations. I don't know. So that was that was really nice. I don't get very many celebrity encounters, but it's nice when they buy our books. Okay, are there any other questions? Because I think we are closing. I think we have, I wouldn't say run out of steam, but we love the book. And there's not really a lot of, not a lot of conflict or opposing <laughs> idea. It's not, we're not a book club. It's not really meant to be like that, but I'm, we love the book. It's wonderful. And what more, what more can you say? Just thinking of um, other 
book selling books and um, mm. obviously um 84 Charing Cross Road is the, the most oh, obvious oh, thing yeah. to compare business as usual to. It is the best. It is the best. Um, yeah, 84 Charing Cross Road, that is also epistolary, written in letters about the love of books. But this you know, business as usual is not about book, really, mm. it's not the titles of books, except the archaeological one that she has to know about. That's just the line. Um, but yeah, I, I, 84 Charing Cross Road has me in tears when I read it at the end because it's terribly sad at the end. Yeah. gorgeous book barbara we you can watch this video in due course when cat has edited it and that's that could be some time because she has a proper job as well um on our youtube channel if you right. go to our home page the link for our youtube channel is is up there so you can just click on that and you should be able to find it or you can subscribe to our newsletter and i will put information with the actual link to this actual video um the newsletter comes out next week so it might catch that one we'll see okay right thank you very much thank you gail for spending the evening talking about this nice book thank you it was fun good thank you cat i have made stars <laughs> oh you're doing <laughs> decorations <laughs> now put it up again show us again i want to see that <laughs> oh oh that's a good one this is something cat learned how to make these amazing paper stars from our cleaner in when we lived in another house and Kat was a lot younger who came from Zimbabwe so Alita made these stars and showed Kat how to do it and you know they're gorgeous oh look Margaret bought the book because it was on the recommended Great. shelves oh, <laughs> that nice thank you for doing that Margaret <laughs> okay right I'm going to close the video off now